Hello, welcome to Gareth Jones on Speed and that uh, clink of coffee and that uh, hubbub in the background is the media suite at the British International Motor Show at XL in London where I'm joined by Zog. How are you doing, Zog? Not bad today, Gareth. How are you? You, you beat me here. I did. What a miracle. Uh, go on, explain how you got here. Well, I would planned to come by public transport. Uh, DLR and Jubilee Line is a good way of getting here. And That's the Docklands Light Railway, I should yeah, say. Yeah, we should DLR. explain to yeah. anyone who doesn't live in London. But for complicated reasons, I ended up having a car last night, and then it was too complicated to, to do anything other than drive here from Fulham, which is in the west of London, over to here in the east of London and actually it was a lot quicker than I thought it was going to be and as a result I beat you here by about half an hour you did yeah and I came from north east London got various tubes and trains and things you did the sensible thing it was a miserable day. Didn't work. <laughs> it was rubbish. I, I have to I've say, been driving here, a lovely sunny day. Traffic wasn't too bad, except ran up in the car. Stop. In your car, listening yeah. to the radio, enjoying yeah. life. Me reading Metro on a tube that stops every thirty seconds. But I've always maintained this thing that it's just as easy to get to Birmingham to the NEC from North London as it is to get to XL from my house. And I had a plan this year that we would attend the, the motor show in some style. That we would turn up driving a Gibbs Aquada. But I failed to get hold of one. I've been chasing Gibbs, writing to them for about two months now, trying to get a response to say, look, can we borrow your Aquada to come down the canal? And then the Thames, no response. And we couldn't waterproof the 944 in time, so, you know, there you go. (laughs) I'm not sure if your member of the Volkswagen Porsche family actually is as buoyant as the VW Beetle was, so no, that won't work, Zog. I'm not going to put it to a test. Anyway, enough about how we got here. We should get down there onto the floor and have a look around. But we've got a few things that are real highlights that we know we definitely want to see. What's your number one favourite? Well, the the highlights for me, um, definitely the Lotus Project Eagle. And I believe they'll be announcing the name uh, of the car today because it should explain the uh, Eagle is Lotus's new uh, 2 Plus 2, which uh, obviously a lot of excitement about that. I'm really looking forward to seeing that. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what name they've come up with. Yeah. You know... it's got to be better than Eagle. Yeah, um, it's got to be better than Eagle. Yeah. We, and, you know, we know it's going to start I, with E. Um, also, the little Eco Elise. That's uh, so sweet. Isn't that fantastic. The second I heard about this, I phoned Richard up and said, I can't make up my mind whether this car is fantastic or hysterical. There's some very. It can be both. Yeah. You know? There's some very funny elements to it. I think the fact that the paint is biodegradable or you, know, you can wash it off is kind of funny. And the idea that the carpets are made out of sizal, which is the sort of thing that appeals to Mrs. Jones, you know. She would like that. Also, it's got some real details to it as well, like the photovoltaic cells in the roof and stuff. I'm mad keen on that kind of thing. I think the panels are one of the most, you know, as you say, these uh, panels which are made of hemp fibre based composite rather than of carbon fibre based composite. It's uh, That's uh, fascinating uh, and slightly funny, of course. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, but, but my question, one thing that I think we will have to ask them biodegradable paint. So, you know, yeah. <laughs> can you leave that car out in the rain or not? <laughs> can you take it to a jet wash? I don't think so. Also, the Lightning, the yeah. Lightning Car Company's uh, electric sports car, which um, I read a little bit about recently, and um, the thing I want to I want to find out a bit more about the company actually, because to be honest, I hadn't heard of Lightning before, and uh, I'm not really sure whether they're a low volume kit car type sports car manufacturer who's stepped up a bit with, with an electric car project or whether it's a start-up. Well, you know what? Let's go down there with this recorder, shove it up the nose of a spokesperson and ask them that, because I don't know as well. And if we don't know, as motoring journalists who care about these things, the public aren't going to know, and brand awareness is a big thing, isn't it, if you want to sell cars? Absolutely. Let's go and record. I'm going to enjoy this. We've got one of those rare moments where we've got complete and utter access to a new car at a motor show. It's because it's press day. There's not that many other people here apart from other press. And Zog and I are the only people at the moment studying the new Vauxhall Insignia. Now, this is the first time I've seen it in the flesh. And the pictures I've seen so far... mm, I would say they don't do it justice. I think it's a fair representation, the pictures that you've seen, of what the car actually looks like. Zog, first impressions, what do you think of the Insignia? I rather like it, actually. I'm a little bit surprised because, you know, it's not the kind of car that I tend to get very excited about. But my first impressions are of a, of a solid, good-looking car that looks like quality. And, yeah. and, and, and the lines, have got, they've got that kind of, I guess, a BMW kind of elegance. I'm not saying it, it is as good-looking as a lot of BMWs have been. Maybe not, not quite that level of design, but it, it's a good-looking car. Come back here, Zog. Come over here. Stand back here. Right, we're standing about three metres away from it, looking at its profile. Look at the sweep of the 
roof line there. Now, the window line yeah. is shallower than the sweep of the roof line, but they've done a similar trick to the Jaguar XF, which makes it look more like a coupe. The trim that sort of fills some of the, the inside of the window line, if you like, and makes the windows actually look smaller. Yeah. Yeah. And a yeah. high-rising, um, what do we call that, swage line? Is that a swage line? I don't, I, I don't know Possibly either. is... Uh, but, but I noticed something on, on that other one over there, that green one. The way that the boot opens is really interesting. If you come over to the boot, it's got this really odd line which you don't normally get boots cut in like that. It's a bit like the old sort of BMW mm, 7 Series boot, that funny sort of little kick-up thing that they have. kink, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the way it hinges, when the boot opens, it seems to hinge in a slightly different way to the way you'd expect it. And it oh, that's interesting. Oh, you I, watch. Haven't, I haven't seen the boot opening, but, get, uh, it's, uh, but I have noticed that they're, they're lovely door handles. Check out the... D- 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 yeah, d- d- come on, let's have a go feel on, of the door go, handle. Open that door. Come on, if come on, only... Have a little, have a, yeah. Here we go, I'm pulling the door handle now. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's oh, yeah. nice, yeah, I wouldn't grab my finger... Go on, get in, Zog, and I'll get around the other side, go on. We've got access to an insignia, I can't believe this. Are we the first podcast journalist to get in one? I wonder, probably not. Here we go. Ah, right. So here we are. Hang on, hang on, let's close the door for a change of audio, here we go. OK. Oh, isn't that quiet? Yeah. Wow, beige, hey, Zog, beige. Okay, and of course, driver on the left here because we're uh, it's a, it's an Opal. It's not a Vauxhall of the show. I wonder if they've got any insignia here actually badged Vauxhall. All the ones on this end of the stand are badged Opal, but I'll, I'll look over there. Maybe they are Vauxhall. But well, I, being, I have to say, valeted, we're just this, up on the outside. this guy <laughs> polishing the car on yeah, the outside. Yeah, he polished <laughs> while we were doing that. While we were recording that last bit, he was actually polishing our foot footprint off the floor out there (laughs) and I think he's got his mobile phone on because I can hear it ticking all over turn your phone off mister I'm trying to record it I have to say, beige interior. Very I can't. Beige. It is, it, everything about it is that that's sort of almost tawny. Would you I call have, it? Um, yeah, or sort of a sort of a, um, a, a, a chocolatey brown. Maybe I have to say, I, I like it less now that we're inside it. It still looks good. Got a slightly more plasticky feel than you know really would would match the exterior to my eyes. Maybe it's just this colour. If we see another one in a different colour, it will look better. It's not bad. It's swoopy. It's certainly better than Vauxhalls have been recently, isn't it? Yeah, and I think the, the, you know, the ergonomics of it, in terms of uh, you know, where the controls are, just, yeah, yeah, basically the layer of things feels good. OK, let's boil this down really simplistically, Zog. Exterior, score out of ten. I think I'd give it, I'd give it a seven and a half. Like yeah, really, seven and a half. Yep, yep. I, I'd, I'd say seven compared to other vehicles in its class, because okay. I, think, I think the Mondeo is pretty sexy. I do, I really do. Yeah, no, no, yeah, no, the, the Ford are doing a great job yeah. at the moment. And interior? Uh, interior's a bit of a letdown for me. I'm going to give the interior a six. Six, all right. That's the official Gareth Jones on speed score for the new Vauxhall, or in this case, Opal Insignia. We found a Vauxhall Insignia with... Vauxhall badging, as opposed to Opal badging. Yeah, we thought it was uh, only Opal badged insignias here at the launch, but apparently not. No, not only is it Vauxhall badge, but the size of the Vauxhall badge, it's enormous. It's much bigger than the Opal Flash, the Vauxhall Griffin. So I thought for one moment when I walked in, oh, hang on, are they giving up on Vauxhall? No, they're not. They're they're actually hammering it home, aren't they? Yeah, I I quite like that new badge, actually, because if you're going to get really geeky and start ranking Mm. car company logos and emblems... Vauxhall doesn't really do it for me, you know, it's always, always rather... That heraldic griffin, it's a bit... Yeah, yeah. But, you know, it's, it's, it's a nice, as you say, heraldic griffin sounds great. Yeah. You know, an actual Vauxhall badge <laughs> doesn't look so great, but, you know, but, 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 but that new style badge on the front of the insignia looks pretty good. A, as good as the car. So the badge, the car gets, what, seven, seven and a half out of ten. The badge probably gets eight, because it's a step so, up, yeah. isn't I th- it? I, th- I, th- I think Vauxhall are going up in our estimation here. Gareth Jones on speed at the British Motor Show. Brilliant! Zog and I have taken a position in front of the Lotus stand for the announcement of the name of what up to now has been called Project Eagle. There's a bit of a buzz, isn't there, Zog? A bit of a buzz. Yeah, anticipation in the air. There's, uh, I wouldn't quite call it a scrum, but cameramen have essentially got the best position so I don't know what we'll see but in the moment in front of me is the car covered in a blue cloth and when they uh, whip that away to an enormous fanfare I would imagine we'll get some kind of applause and uh, 
We'll find out what the little baby's going to be called. I think Excel is still the best name as it's launched here. I don't but think it, they're going to call it that, though, are they? It, it would be quite appropriate, wouldn't it? Excel. You know, I'm having a hard time thinking of what other words starting in either are in the English language that would suit a lotus. Eric. Eric. Uh, Eric the half a lotus. Uh, <laughs> Ernest. Erdos. Ergun. One, one for the mathematicians there. Uh, what could it be? It's going to be a new name, apparently. They're not going to draw on revive, previous names. Uh, r- r- revive an old lotus name. Won't be a clat or a clate with an E on the end. It won't be that, no. What was the Elan era? Car? Very, very pretty little, um, super pretty car. Oh, Elite. Was it the Elite? The Elite, yes. yes. Yeah. yeah, very, very pretty yeah. little car. Uh, again, won't, you know, it won't be a lead, yeah, no. Lovely, you know, and a good name, but... Um... Well, we'll find out in a few minutes. This is great. The launch is just about to happen for the new Lotus Project Eagle. Um, a bunch of guys have just walked up onto the stage with their, their features blanked out. So they're literally faceless people. I, I tell you, I'm, I'm glad I haven't got any kids with me. They'll be absolutely terrified. This is like something from Doctor Who. Okay, someone's going to make an announcement. Is it Mike Kimberley? Thank you. I must admit I'm delighted today to reveal what is in fact a true character in, as you can see here, a faceless world. Well, the covers are off. We still don't know the name, but we're feeling we're about to find out. Uh, well, I'm very pleased that uh, we've driven away those faceless people, but. Uh, Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to all. Um, I would like to say, with the support of our board and shareholders, particularly uh, Chairman... Dr. Well, Adam my guess is that this speech is going to go on for another uh, 25 minutes, uh, telling us stuff that we, we already know. Um, I guess they're trying to build the excitement. So, uh, well, it looks like he's going to announce the name of the new Lotus. I'll start recording again. Today, today's economics, this is an absolute key issue. Some considerable time later. It is in fact two companies. No, he still isn't going to tell us the name of the car. Now within the five year plan, Lotus Cars Limited will deliver three new models. Even later. And if I'd like to, if I may, invite Dato Aslan, who is the chairman of Proton and also the chairman of Group Lotus, to step forward and let you have a few of the most uh, bits and pieces of information, but most important of all, the secret of the name of our new car. Thank you, Dato Aslan. So, Dato Aslan's going to reveal the name, not Mike Kimberley. Thank you very much, Michael. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Lotus Stand. On behalf of Proton, a shareholder of Lotus, we'd like to congratulate Lotus on this We're going to have to wait. Ladies and gentlemen, I have very much enjoyed watching this new Lotus sports car evolve from the drawing board over the years. Thank you to everyone. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I give you the new Lotus Evora. Thank you. It's called the Evora. E-V-O-R-A. What does that mean? Does it mean anything? Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much again for being here today to help us launch the new Lotus Evora, and uh, I hope you have a good morning and a good afternoon. Zog, Evora, what does that mean to you? No idea. That's probably a good thing, then. It's a blank sheet of paper. That's what they're talking about. Let's hope so. Evora, Evo, as in evocative or evolution? Well, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, my, my mind is slightly uh, influenced by the fact that I've just seen uh, Wally at the weekend, so I'm thinking Eva, I'm thinking, you know, small white robot, kind of cute. Evora! Evo, Evo. <laughs> Evora! Uh, this is the designer with the best name in car design, a Russell car. Great name. I interviewed him about 14 years ago. Nice guy. 
can't keep his eyes open when you ask him questions, though. When he answers questions. Well, that's, wor- that's worrying. You, sort of, you, you, you think you've asked a really boring question. <laughs> I don't know about the dynamics. I've got dynamics in my hands of the moment trying to talk about the car. I'll just take a brief moment to talk about the design process on the car. As Mike has said, he said it's a very clear, simple brief. We had to make the car visually stunning. Well, now that the speeches have uh, come to an end, a rather tall young lady managed to straddle the sill and get into the car, open the door, and then they pressed the button, and the first Lotus Evora show model is rotating for us now. And first impressions, I know you've seen the pictures, but in the flesh, a slightly blander, bigger Elise that's crashed into a Lancia Stratos, maybe. Certainly the glass house is very stratoric. Stratoric, I just invented a new word. I don't think it's as dramatic as the Elise. There aren't enough swoops and curves. Certainly gorgeous, and I'm sure it'll go like stink and handle beautifully. Not sure it's quite dramatic enough, though. The Evora. Now, Russell Carr, who just made that speech, is the man who designed the Lotus Evora... And I think he's free for a moment, so let's see if we can get a quick chat for Gareth Jones on speed with him. You did the spree thing with me. Yeah. That's right, yeah. And of course I grew up with you on... Oh, Saturday. you don't Saturday. tell me. Well, student, that would have been student days. We both had more hair. I've, I've, I've grown up with Lotus cars, so we're even um, now, aren't we? <laughs> um, congratulations, Russell. Thank you very much. Um, uh, how was the reaction? It was a bit subdued, I felt. I, was, I thought there'd be a bit more of a yell. I think probably because it's been in the press during the week, people have seen it before, and it's hot here as well. But we've had very good feedback. We've shown it to the dealers. They're completely bowled over with the car as well. And probably the, the toughest test is we're very confident with the car because we're our worst critics, so we're very confident it's going to be a success. I think, pers- it's only a personal view, I think it's lost a bit of the drama that the Elise has in that you've got the straighter lines. It's not a swoopy. Was that a deliberate choice? It's a deliberate choice to make the car look shall we say, a little bit more grown up, a little bit more sophisticated. We'll always keep the Elise like it is, a very dramatic looking car, you know, very over the top of the form language. But we want this car to be something that you can turn up at a nice restaurant or a nice hotel and feel proud and confident without feeling too self-conscious about. And, you know, we want to give the car its own uh, character anyway. It sells in a different price bracket, so... There's not much point emulating the Elise, but you can see the two cars are of a similar family. It's definitely a Lotus. That's, that's probably the most important thing. The DNA just shines right the way through. How difficult is it to take something as well established as the Lotus brand and just inch it that bit further up? Wouldn't it be easy just to do like a one and a half scale Elise? Uh, well, as designers, you know, we're, we've always got another better design, so we're always searching for, for new things. So, no, we always want to push the brand forward, and we're very conscious that some people in the past have stood still for too long, and suddenly the market moves on. So we always want to be moving ahead with our products. We wanted this car to have a classical twist to it, because it's important the car looks good today, looks good in five years, and looks good in 20 years when it's on the classic car market. Uh, it's still doing work for our brand so we don't want to create a car that is very fashionable has its moment for a year and then no one wants anymore so. how, how do you avoid doing that how do you avoid making a car really fashionable what are things that you said right we're not doing that i think really we take a very traditional view to the form language which is very fluid very curvaceous type of form language not putting any features on there that look too self-conscious really everything's got to look effortless and as I said we try and incorporate features that are very much to do with the technical functionality of the car as well so I think if the car's honest then it then it lasts very well whereas the ones perhaps where you know they're trying too hard they date and it's the same in fashion as well isn't it and we've all been there you you wear things that uh, that shout out at the time because you want to be noticed but you look back it's dated whereas you know classic tailoring looks good today and it looks good in you know, 10 years' time as well. So, no gas top, back comb, tall hair well, for you that could car. Fit, you could fit inside that car <laughs> with your original hairstyle, so. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's, that's quite an achievement. Can I ask you one question about the, the derivation of the name of the car? Mm. How did that come about? What, were the, what did he turn down? Oh, I couldn't tell you what we turned down. We looked at a lot of names. There's a lot of issues because, most importantly, the name has to suit the product. So we wanted something which felt exotic and glamorous and had movement in it, and Avora just rolls off the tongue and obviously sounds, sounds very exotic as well. 
but of course we have to look through a number of different names because other people have registered them or you find out it means something rude in a certain language or, um, or certain languages can't pronounce it. For example, they pronounce it in a way you don't want it pronounced. So it was a long, drawn-out process. Uh, probably took slightly longer than designing and engineering the car to name the car, I would say. I, I figured uh, we were playing a guessing game what it was going to be. We thought they're launching it XL. It could be the XL with an E on the end, the XL, but no, it's going to be a new name. I've got it, I said. It's the connection between the Europa, right, yeah. and the fact that your relationship with Proton, it's the Eurasia. That's yeah. what it could have been. It could well have been as well. No, <laughs> but we're very happy with the name we've got. We think it suits the car perfectly. I think it's a good name. We've never encountered it before. It will only refer to that car, and that's the most important thing. Russell, nice to talk to you again, nice man. Nice to see you again. Cheers. Nice to see you the show somewhere else, perhaps. I'll Bye. be around. From the high performance super excitement of the Evora to the relatively mundane Ford Fiesta. Now, I love Ford. I was really looking forward to seeing the Fiesta in the flesh. And as we walked towards the Ford stand, we passed the Mazda 2, which is essentially the same car. And I asked you, Zog, OK, take a look at the, the Mazda 2, have a look at the Fiesta, and tell me which one you think's better looking. Which one do you think's better looking? I think the Mazda, actually. It, it's just a prettier car. The, the Fiesta's not bad looking. To me, the, the Fiesta, is, it's, it's not outstanding in the way that maybe some of the better recent Ford designs have been. Whereas that, the Mazda 2, is, that's a really pretty little car. For it a... is. It's, I like the crease that it's got. And I think the... I, was, I tell you what, I was disappointed when I saw the Fiesta. Two things. It was slightly rounder than I was hoping. I was hoping for it to be a bit more angular, and it, it's quite two generation Mondeos ago in that respect. It's round in certain ways. And second of all, the three-door version, the line of the roof and the boot and the way that the rear window climbs up, if you've got a picture of what was sold as the Ford Aspire in America about ten years ago, which itself was a, a Mazda or a Kia, it was the same car, yeah. Almost identical. So, Ford running out of ideas, or are they just redoing something they've done before? Was my, my opinion. I love the Fiesta. I'd like to see it on the road. I'm hoping it looks a bit more individual on the road than it does in a show because it's good, but it's not great. It yeah, it, it, it doesn't really. It doesn't stand out. Really, does it? Does it? As we were wandering around the halls here, I think you're seeing a lot of cars that are demonstrating a bit of Chris Bangle influence. I think think his sort of period at BMW and, and a lot of what he did with uh, styling of the BMWs, which didn't always go down very well at the time, as quite a lot of innovative design tends to do. A lot of those things are, are, are appearing on a lot more cars. We saw quite a few more shapes of newer cars around today where there was a bit of kind of BMW DNA bleeding in there. That's an interesting thing, isn't it? Where a designer of one mark is so influential, or if you like, outrageous, that he's influencing not only his own DNA, but the DNA of other brands as well. He can be proud of that. Now, speaking of distinctive-looking things, we also dropped in on the Cadillac stand. Now, you're a real Cadillac fan. What, yeah. do, what do you make of uh, what we saw there? Like the There's three things. There's the little BLS, which is essentially a, a Saab 9.3 rebodied and, and built in the Saab Trollhattan plant in, in Sweden. Great, solid, lovely. I drive one of those. I'm interested in the Cadillac brand because, you know, a number of car companies, Hyundai, have created... I suppose Genesis is a sub-brand for them, moving the Hyundai brand upmarket. Nissan have got their upmarket brand to rival Lexus, yeah. Infinity brand. But GM don't have to do that. They've got a perfectly good brand in Cadillac. And at the moment, you know, American cars are so cheap because the dollar is down against the pound sterling that you can buy a Cadillac for really sensible money. They've failed on a number of occasions to make Cadillac work in Europe. But with some of these new designs now, they stand a good chance. They've got a British designer, Simon Cox, as well, who created the language for Cadillac a few years ago. I know that the coupe that they've got there, the CTS, CTS coupe, yeah. which is going into production, wasn't designed by him per se, but certainly he's influenced that design. And I love that. I, I like it. I, I think it looks like two cars crashed into one. You know, it's quite sort of 
angular at the front but absolutely straight and geometric at the back and I like that I like cars in conflict they're often quite interesting do yeah. you like it? I wasn't quite as taken with it as you I couldn't really see myself driving one what I did notice was that the saloon version parked alongside it looked significantly less good than the coupe though which was a real shame because that coupe is quite a dramatic sharp looking car and in adapting it to the four door version there are a few things that have changed including the just the line of the doors adding door handles makes a huge difference and it's yeah. really really spoiled the line of the size I, I think that's a real shame if they could only have even just kept the door handles off the saloon version and had a flush four door shape just like they've got the flush two doors that would have looked much much better what don't you like at this show Zog is there a kind of an overall theme of things that you've seen that are bugging you my eye keeps getting caught by too many sort of sparkly, nice, lovely things. Oh, look at that, look at that, oh, look at her, whatever it is. <laughs> and so, you know, I've seen a few things I haven't liked, but they haven't bothered me for a moment because I've just moved straight on. How about wheels? Oh, oh I, OK, yeah, you're right. OK, I wasn't, wasn't really true when I said they were, I hadn't seen anything I'd like. Shiny wheels. There are shiny wheels on so many of the show cars right here, and they just look stupid. I don't like the shiny alloy wheels. They had them on that new Land Rover, the, the, the LRX, which is a nice-looking vehicle. Yeah. Silly-looking wheels. Interesting, they're billing it as Land Rover's Mini, aren't they, the LRX? Yeah, it's not really Mini, is it? It's a, that's that's a, some new definition of Mini. <laughs> yeah, I think BMW's definition of Mini has been stretched somewhat recently anyway. Well, that, that, that's true. That's it for this episode of Gareth Jones on Speed, but that's not it from the British International Motor Show 2008. If you want to hear more of me and Zog rattling and prattling on about fantastic new and interesting cars, then why don't you download Gareth Jones on Speed, episode 64, or as we prefer to call it, Gareth Jones on Speed at the British International Motor Show, part two. You know where to find it, garethjones.tv. See you for the next show. You can write to the show on speed at garethjones.tv. More information at www.garethjones.tv or subscribe for free at the iTunes store. Gareth Jones on Speed is made by Wizback. Back. <laughs>